All right, it's, uh, it's about time, so we're gonna get started. Thanks for coming to our talk today. Our title is Design Essentials for Developers, with the idea that we are going to help developers improve understanding, communication, and collaboration uh, with designers. So I guess to start, I should tell you who we are. I brought um, a real live designer here to talk to us today. Real live designer. You can tell I'm a live designer and real because I am dressed in my ceremonial garb of all black. Um, I do have a tattoo, so I am definitely a designer. Um, I'm Michael Salomon. I work at a company called Effective UI. We're based in Denver, Colorado, and we're your user experience agency. Um, I got about 20 years in the design field professionally. And I also teach at the University of Colorado, where I try to instill a lot of really hard, mean design facts into my young students and warp their little minds. Um, but I also work with RJ there as well. Yeah, my name's RJ Owen. I'm a senior software architect at Effective UI. I've been a developer for about 12 years now, working at Effective UI for, for about five. Um, I'm not wearing the developer ceremonial garb. I'm not wearing a hoodie. This is like, I don't know, hipster cowboy or something. And you're clean shaven. And I'm clean shaven, yeah. Under caffeinated for, for normal programming. Um, but yeah, Michael and I have been working at Effective UI together for the last couple of years. And today we'd like to talk about, um, well, first let's talk about who are you. So how many people in the audience today are developers, are programmers of some kind? OK, great. Right how about designers? Any designers in the room? Black, black, black. Ish. Probably a black, there you go. probably okay. black under there. Okay, cool. Um, everyone else in the room is then what? Just marketing managers or product managers or operations or something? Okay. Hi. Welcome. Yes, those are good things too. Okay, cool. Um, so today we're going to talk about design essentials for developers. Like we said, I'm excited that there are so many developers in the room because this talk is really for you. Uh, and what we want to get out of today is a, uh, first and foremost, is a common language for developers to be able to talk to designers. Um, as a developer, we hope that out of this talk, you will come away uh, understanding design terms, understanding design language, and being able to put categories around a lot of things that you probably understand intuitively already. Yeah, and, and it's a, it's a, it should be a collaborative environment, right? We should be working with developers every day, every minute of the day, being able to see where they're at in the process and how our designs are being uh, implemented. It, it's, uh, I think you had a really good antidote, antidote about um, architecture. Architecture, kind of yeah. Being... Yeah, so in, in a lot of fields where we build things, like architecture, you have one person who understands both the crafting of the thing and the way that the thing is supposed to look when it's done. So in architecture, you've got an architect who spends a lot of time at architecture school learning how to make things beautiful, but also learning how to make things functional, and they have to be able to make blueprints and understand uh, forces and build a good building. And then during the building process, an architect will be on site a lot of the times, helping to oversee the construction, working directly with the foreman to make sure that his, his plans are completely realized or hers. And in software, that's not yet the case. No, in it, some places it is. It feels like we do all of our work and then from the design standpoint and then just kind of huck it over the wall and those baby birds fly off and we never really get to see what happened. And eventually later on, if you do a pixel review or, or design reviews, you end up wondering why all these decisions had been made without your consent. And there's a lot of really creative places that, that do really good things to try to break down that wall between developers and designers and get them to work closely together. But there's still this fundamental thing that the design's being done by one person and the development is being implemented by someone else. And that creates a gap and that causes problems. And so today we're hoping that we can bridge that gap a little bit and help developers to better speak design language. Yeah. So the funniest part about this is that developers do design already. In fact, unless you work in a, in a team where um, the designers are coming up with every possible use case, every possible edge case, every possible error case, every possible screen, you're probably going to find that development's doing as much design as design is, because that's where the boots hit the ground. Yeah, so designers frequently do a lot of upfront design and a lot of generative to de design. But then as a developer, while you're implementing it, uh, you find all sorts of things that were left out. As a developer, you're the first user of your application. And so you play a really important role in the design process. And you've probably cultivated a pretty, pretty good design sensibility already. 
uh, in implementing these things, in going through lots of different wireframes, and in working with design practitioners, you know a lot about design just inherently. And so today, we're hoping that we can give you uh, language and terms that you can put around those things that you know to have uh, more efficient and more productive interactions. So what does design really encompass, though? Because it's all kinds of stuff, right? It's application design and game design and UX design and service design and interface design and product design and industrial design. I mean, it, it is a whole host of things. But obviously, we're not going to be able to cover all that in a short time. So we're going to narrow it to a really discrete piece of the pie that hopefully will impact your day-to-day -day operations. We're going to talk about graphic design, interaction design, and hopefully we can squeeze in a little bit of design research. Yeah. And our goal in these things is to break down the discipline into a set of terms, into a set of uh, building blocks, and then show you how they relate to things that we do on the web. Great. So um, let's cover graphic design first. And I think graphic design, the really easy way to say it is that you're trying to make the intent of the design visible and emotional. Um, the, the, fun, the fun part about this is we kind of, kind of have a good idea of what good design is, when you see it, you know it feels right, but we definitely have a clear idea of what bad design is. Um, this is, a, I think, a pretty good example of bad design. This is um, the emergency medical services from Fayetteville, from uh, Uniontown, Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. This freaks me out in a, a whole host of reasons. First off, it really doesn't say Safety. Safety at all. I have no confidence that if I'm bleeding out on the side of the road that these guys are really going to know what to do. Um, because their text is bleeding out all over the Color page. theory, like arrangement, alignment. There's a, a whole host of things that are wrong with this. And everybody automatically picks up on it. Um, I w when I pulled this slide, I really thought it was from, you know, 97, 99. This is from 2009. So bad design is prevalent still today. But what is good design, right? How do we even begin to talk about good design? And what I like to do is break out Paul Rand, super awesome graphic designer. I like to use his definition. And it's the effective use of the language of form. But what's the language of form, right? So here comes four years of graphic design college in about 35 slides. And we're going to hit them maybe half a second each slide. Um, I do not expect you to understand this um, at this top level right now. What I do want to use this as, as a reference that you can go back and, use and look through it. Um, the slides that I'm, I'm going to show have been pulled from a really awesome uh, motion graphic piece by Imaginary Forces for the Paul Rand retrospective. But what it gets into is those pure terms of the language of design. And these are things that we get hammered on as a design student. I have a traditional design background, and I remember repeatedly just getting nailed with these kind, of, these kind of terms. And they are order, variety, contrast, symmetry, tension, that's an awesome one, balance, scale, really important when you're doing visual hierarchies, texture, space, shape, light, shade, and color. And color's the last one because color is a big deal. Color is really hard to deal with. And as a, usually as, um, in a traditional design environment, you don't get to play with color until about your second year of design school. You are forced to deal with basic black and white shapes or monotone chrom chrom uh, chromatic kind of designs. And you have to come to terms with all of the other languages of design before you get into color because color adds a whole another level of, of crazy to it. But Having deconstructed that, I have to say that it's more than the sum of its parts. You can't simply deconstruct all of the designs into um, all of the pieces and think that you're going to be able to have good design. Because we end, up bump, we end up bumping into things like gestalt psychology. This is uh, an image of, that is, is related to emergence. And I'm hoping you can see it on the screen, but there's a Dalmatian walking in a, in a, a shady park. That's a solid color, like monochromatic, right? We have uh, on and off right there. And very quickly, your brain figures out figure from ground. The ground, the figure ground relationship is a big deal from the design side. How do I know what is the important part, the foreground, what pops off, and what's the background? What becomes um, necessary for me to just think of it as decoration at that point? 
the cool thing about this is that your brain does this without you even having to think about it. Behind the scenes, you very quickly start looking at it, discerning what it is, start doing grouping and trying to figure it out, and all of a sudden the, the Dalmatian will pop right off. Um, babies can do this, monkeys can do this, even um, brain damaged graphic designers can do this in their sleep. Uh, robots and computers cannot do this. This so, is like the ultimate Turing test, is if you and a computer could sit around and talk about um, the figure ground relationship in a gestalt image like this. And so, I mean, we threw out a lot of terms there really fast, and Michael's talking a little bit now about how to apply them. We don't expect you to remember all of that order and symmetry stuff. We'll make these slides available. Yep. And the idea is that just understanding that there are these basic building blocks and that by combining them, uh, graphic design can produce um, a mood and a uh, sort of a, a sense of what the application does for the user. Right, and these are the terms that we've been using for years and years and years. So to very quickly get to what the root of the problem is, RJ can come up to me and say, I think uh, this design doesn't have enough tension in it. Or there's a lot of tension here. Can you explain to me a little bit about why it's so unbalanced? And then your designer can either explain to you, well, I'm trying to create sort of like a frantic mood on this screen, or they can say, you know, you're right. This is something they're going to be staring at all day, every day. We should probably balance this out a little bit. And this shouldn't be a challenge to the designer's aesthetic or the designer's sensibility, because we are in a collaborative mode here. I want him to come to me with a problem before it gets out, before somebody else sees it. I want to be called on it internally so that I can make the arrangements and fix it. And even more than developers, uh, I think designers are trained in design school to accept that kind of critique. There's a lot of critique of each other's work that goes on. And so they learn not to take it personally, whereas developers, uh, I think we get a little more territorial about our code. If somebody comes up and says, I think that this inheritance model is not very good, uh, we're much more prone to get really amped up and, and say, no, this must have an abstract class and 400 interfaces and all this kind of stuff. So uh, don't be afraid to talk to designers about no. these kind of things. We love graphic design knife fights. It's what we were trained for. So it's always fun. In addition to you know, the gestalt psychology that ends up happening, there's also a lot of geometry and math. So developers don't think that this is just a bunch of magic that we ended up sitting in a room and figuring out the, the, the right potion for. There's a lot of science behind it as well. So the golden ratio, right? harmony and proportions. We feel like it's a very proportionate design because of this ratio. And if you know that this exists, then you start finding places that it's been implemented. So in an earlier redesign of uh, Twitter's website, they used the golden ratio as uh, a very important design principle. At, at the most minimized screen size, they have effectively designed the ratio into all of their, all of their comps. Color, I kind of led on to this because it's so crazy. Um, color does weird things that people don't even recognize. Uh, it's not just about going to the Home Depot and picking out paint chips. It's a little bit more than that because you end up getting into things like radiation and vibration where two colors next to each other might give off a little bit of, of movement that you may not want necessarily want. Um, this is uh, Adobe's cooler site, which is a, a really good utility for understanding color harmony and color theory. And what you can do is you can interact with the color wheel and find the science behind it, which essentially is gonna help you pick really strong color palettes and you don't have to have a lick of color theory behind it. And as a developer, we're not really expecting that developers will have to do a lot of, of color theory type work, but um, just understanding things like warm colors uh, come to the front and warm colors look like they're in front of cooler colors that, that kind of a principle is important as a developer. Um, and you already know that like red is a warning color and green is a confirmation color. Uh, blue is very calm. Um, just understanding that the color selection is a huge part of things that designers do um, can help you have a little bit more sensitivity to the colors in your design and have a more productive dialogue with designers about color. Yeah, and we are super detail oriented. We've been hammered on it all day, all day in school to look at every single detail. So very quickly, I'm gonna know right away if that color is off by a couple shades. If it's a hue off, I'm gonna know it, and I'm, I'm gonna ask in a pixel review, what's up with this weird orange? Uh, if you don't have the insight as to why I'm crazy about that, you're gonna think I'm just going nuts in the middle of a, of a pixel review. So let's yeah, talk about- a lot more we could talk about with color, yeah. but you know, we're trying to cover a lot of ground. But the grid, the, the grid is another, another piece of this. Um, for any of those that aren't um, 
familiar with the grid, I think of it as an armature for which to hang design on. Uh, very quickly you can, can start laying out where visual hierarchy appears and then figure out a really good formula for uh, look, making your design look like it actually had some intent behind it, like there was some thought throughout the thing. Your user or your reader can then figure out very quickly what becomes important. Where's a headline? Where's a subhead? Where's a paragraph break? Where's some content? Where are the buckets of, of individual um, portions that you're going to end up trying to get into? And you don't have this cognitive dissonance of trying to understand what is going on with this design. Is it, is it just a pizza that somebody threw a bunch of toppings on and threw out there? Um, by having the grid, you're allowed to um, position and place elements in a very constructive manner, but it breaks the grid. It allows you to find an element that you want to call more attention to, and by breaking it off the grid, by changing it from its traditional layout, you give it more focus and therefore more importance. Yeah, the grid was a really important um, underlying principle for me to understand as a developer, because designers, this is like the thing that designers get wigged out about, right? Like, you go to a design review, or, or you go show them what you've been implementing, and they're always going, well, that, that pixel's like, this element is two pixels off. This thing needs to be a little bit farther down. This thing needs to be a little bit farther over. And half the time, as a developer, I'm thinking, how do you even see that? How can you tell? You didn't even zoom in on my monitor or whatever. And just knowing that developers, uh, I mean, designers think in the grid. The same way that developers think in class hierarchies and think in information architecture, Designers think in the grid um, when it comes to graphic design. Everything needs to be laid out according to lines, uh, except in the cases, like Michael said, where that rule is being purposefully broken. Uh, all of these rules are meant to be broken, but you have to understand and know the rule in order to break it responsibly. And so when you break it, you're saying something. You're saying this piece of information is so interesting and so valuable that we've broken it away from the form and structure of the rest of the page and put it up in front of you. So, typography. Obviously, we got all our control freak designers in here that have been working very hard from a typography standpoint. On the web right now, um, it's getting a little bit better with the at font face tag, but know that I have a very clear structured idea of what I need from typography, and if you break the rules that I may have set up, I'm going to see it. If you bold something incorrectly, if you don't use the right typeface, it is going to drive me nuts because I spent a significant amount of time trying to figure out what that typeface was. And the typeface, the font itself, um, will oftentimes adhere to a lot of the rules we've already talked about, where fonts have their own structure and fonts have their own alignment. And we're not going to get really deep into typography and ligatures and all of that stuff today, but just knowing that the font that a designer chooses is specific to the application they're trying to build, and the font should invoke and uh, say the same things as the rest of the design elements. Mm -hmm. So as developers, it's important to pay attention to the font and get those kind of like spacing and sizes uh, correct. But at the same time, if a designer has, has given you a CSS sheet that's got 9,000 different font sizes and different font variations in it, that might be a good opportunity to have a discussion and say, um, what are we trying to say with all of these different type elements? There's a lot going on here. I think that this could confuse users. Uh, can we narrow this down to five or six major, major font items? So back to what RJ was saying about how I can see pixels from a mile away. I actually, in, in reviews, wonder, why don't you care about my pixel spacing? Oh, I know calling a function and making something work is important, but come on, all my alignment is, laid, is all, all over the place. So that's the reason why, because I've been hammered on how to design the right way to design, the communication, to be able to communicate design, the effective use of form, and when I get into a design review and none of those things have happened, I kind of go a little berserk. So please cut your designers a little bit of slack if you see them doing this because they're only trying to come to terms with what they think has been abandoned. Yeah, it looks to them like it looks to you when you see bad code. Very bad. Okay, so that's a real brief overview of graphic design, obviously super brief. Um, Interaction design, we're going to even do a briefer version of it, because the, the point of interaction design is to kind of expose the intent of the design through your actions and your feedback. And interaction design is kind of a new um, career, kind of a new field. It's been hobbled together by a, a bunch of different design practitioners. You have um, psychologists and user interface specialists, 
and human factors engineers, and maybe even some product designers considered interaction design. And industrial design probably is a little bit of an action, interaction design. But what it's been told to the community at large is that this is the magic spot where we're going to make all of your hopes and dreams for financial success come true. If you have good UX, if you have good interaction design, then your product's going to go far. And I agree with that, but it is not a magic bullet. It is a subset of the rest of the design process. And in order to break them down like we did visually, we should probably do it through Don Norman's design vocabulary. Yeah, there's lots of different frameworks you could apply to interaction, lots of different ways you could look at the way people interact with things. And the one we've chosen here to talk about today is a framework that Don Norman came up with. Don Norman is a, um, I, I, I just call him a usability specialist, and he wrote a book called The Design of Everyday Things, where he looked at real world functional objects and talked about the things that made them either very usable or very unusable. And he looked at things like doors and telephones and refrigerators and, and juicers and um, talked about what he thought went into good experiences in those things and what made for bad ones. And he identified six major heuristics that we can use to evaluate interactive objects. And so we're going to go through each of these and talk about uh, what they are and how they apply to software. Cool. Start with visibility? Yeah. So visibility, very simply, is the ability to see the function of the object. So it's not a very uh, complicated principle. Um, this thing has very low visibility. Looking at it immediately, you might think, faucet. Oh, that's a faucet. Or that's a door handle. Or that's a hook. This is actually a lamp. It's a very elegant, uh, well-designed lamp, but it, is, it has very, very low visibility because you would never look at it and say, it's a lamp. Um, in context, it might be easier to figure out, but still, you need other design cues. You need something else to tell you that this is a lamp. There's also no way to turn this lamp on that you can see. There's no button. There's no pull. There's, there's nothing. Um, it's a touch lamp. And even lamps that look like lamps that are touch lamps drive me crazy. As a little kid, I'd be groping around trying to find the switch to turn on this lamp. You bump it with your elbow, and all of a sudden, it turns on. And you have no idea why it turned on until you figure out, oh, it's because I'm touching it and touching it in the correct place. Um, so the, the visibility of something like that is very low, especially in contrast to a lamp like this. Um, not as pretty, not as elegant, but completely usable, right? And, and pretty and elegant to some people who are really into Mickey Mouse. But it has this pull thingy, um, which everybody knows turns on the lamp. So you can see it's much more usable. This is also a good illustration of a place where those design rules are meant to be broken. So our first lamp is trying to make a statement. It's trying to say something, and it's breaking all sorts of design rules on purpose to do it. So the point there is it's not necessarily bad to break uh, visibility. You just have to understand that you're sacrificing something in terms of usability when you do that. And I'm sure that every interior designer in every hotel I've stayed in in the last couple months uh, hates visibility from the lamp standpoint. I walked into a number of darkened rooms, never been able to find the light. I think my iPhone doubles more as a lamp now than it does a communication device. Yeah. So I can find my way through the. I have the flashlight app on my homepage because when you go into a you go into a hotel room, it's always late at night, and you can't find the switches and the lamps have these bizarre things. Yeah, bad visibility. Bad visibility. Uh, another version of bad visibility would be the Gilt app. Are you guys familiar with Gilt, the highfalutin discount shopping application? Uh, this is on the iPad. This is the iPad version. Um, they do have some good usability and visibility with the left hand kind of list view. But the purple smock area is kind of a concern to me. Yeah, so the, uh, the main content area here where we see uh, Shoshana um, modeling this midnight whatever shirt, um, it looks like something that you just click on to open the object and then be able to buy it. You actually can swipe this thing left and right to see other pictures. And then to add it to your cart, you're supposed to tap on her and then drag it down to the cart area. And you can see there's no visual cue for any of that. There's nothing on this image that says this should be swiped or this should be tapped and dragged. And you can see there at the bottom, there's actually some text to tell the user uh, you should be dragging things. And text like that is a big hint. Yeah, if, if you have to explain to a user that much about what to do, then your design probably isn't working. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not readily available, right? It's not visible. So visibility plays really well with our second design principle. 
which is affordance or affordances. And put simply, affordance is that um, things look the way that they're supposed to be used. So on the left here, we have some door handles. Uh, this is from the, the main door at our office at Effective UI. And um, door handles are a great example of affordance because it's something that everybody uses every day. And horizontal door handles automatically say this should be pushed. Vertical door handles just say to people this should be pulled. It makes much more sense from a pulling motion. If you've ever gone up to a door with a vertical handle and tried to pull it only to find out it's a push, you feel stupid, right? But it's not your fault. That's, that's poor design. That's a bad affordance. That's like a button that's actually a dial, or, or if this button flipped up and, and had some controls underneath it or something. Um, buttons are obvious, easy affordances, because you can only do one thing with it, and that's push it. So uh, these are very clear affordances that we see in the real world. We also see them online, too. And they end up taking some of the, the metaphors that we use both online and in the real world. So for instance, Apple's iOS toggle switches in the upper right-hand corner. Um, very, feel very much like the on-off switch for a, a light switch, the push me, the volume control, um, even the slide to unlock, which I know I just railed on, so do you have an issue with the fact that well, Apple... Well, because they have to describe to you that this is unlocking your phone. Yeah. But otherwise, I mean, you know that you're supposed to slide it. It's a very obvious affordance. Mm -hmm. um, we also see the reuse of some metaphors. So in the lower right-hand corner, we have um, that, like, resizer tab where you can, you know, drag the window out. But we also see it in the sortable list items in the, in the image above it. Those gripper bars or those skid marks, if you grab them, you can reorder the stack of the um, list items. That's kind of the same metaphor, but turned on its side, but you still get the same experience. So that's where the rule has been broken a little bit, but not so much that you have lost context. Yeah, and in the digital world, we're really balancing affordances that that look like their function from the real world and teaching users about new affordances. And so these gripper bars to reorganize an item, it's becoming a standard thing that everyone understands to the point that, that it is a new affordance now, like a door handle, um, whereas something like a button is uh, a translation from the real world into the digital world that makes a lot of sense to people. Great. The third principle we want to talk about is feedback. Feedback you could define as the system reacting to the user in a way that lets the user know what happened. And in the real world, we have things like door locks and light switches. Um, on the door lock, the deadbolt turns in direction to tell the user that they've done something. You feel a click, you hear a click, and you can uh, see the orientation change on the, the lock. All of that is giving the user feedback. It's not intentional. It's a byproduct of the system, but it works really well. You know if your door is locked or not. Same with a light switch. Unless the switch works a light that's somewhere else in the house, which could definitely be true, especially in an older house, um, a user normally has immediate feedback that what they've done has or has not accomplished their goals. And we see this in the real world online all the time where you get the, the message of press click to submit and only click it once. Please only press submit one time. That's because your system didn't give me feedback fast enough, and I hammered the button, and then nothing happened, so I nailed it twice more. Behind the scenes, some order is being propagated, but I didn't know that, so three more hits because I think my machine's locked up. And now I have like eight pairs of Converse coming to my house, and I really didn't even want one. Uh. And then you can share them with your friends, with all of your designer friends. Mm -hmm. um. We all look the same anyway. <laughs> In the, uh, they're all black. In the digital world, um, you see things like this all the time. We have uh, download bars telling the user, here's how far your file is. We get more explicit feedback telling them how many bits they've actually downloaded, uh, stuff like that. You get, you get this. Great. So mapping. Mapping is the next piece. Um, show the example. I think that's the best way to do it. And I, I actually hate this thing. I've seen it a number of times. I, I never know what to do. It's, it's a shower. It's a, it's a faucet. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> It just drives me nuts. So yeah, the principle of mapping is that the user's representation of the interface, the interface should map the user's representation of the system. Uh, the interface is the system to the user. So in this case, this is a, uh, a hotel room where the plumbing for the faucet and the shower are so intertwined that they use the same set of controls. On the far right, you have a diverter switch that tells the user whether they're, they're sending water to the shower or the sink. And then in the middle, you have your normal uh, 
temperature control, and then we have the faucet on the far right. And this makes no sense to a user because no one is trying to accomplish the same goal with a sink and a shower. There are very few people who are trying to bathe in their sink. And so when they go to their shower to think, oh, I need to go over to my sink control and make sure I switch it to the shower mode, uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. This is a byproduct of the system, and maybe there was a really good reason they had to put these controls together, but it's gonna take the user some time to figure out because it doesn't match their model, their mental model of what they're trying to do. And they tasked some poor designer with designing an icon that was gonna communicate this to them, and apparently he matched what maybe the shower head looked like, but without seeing it, now all of a sudden there's a overhead it mic looks like speaking a at me yeah. about whether or not I'm clean enough. I have no idea. Yeah, so this is, I mean, those, those icons again um, that are sort of giving away the fact that the system is designed in, in such a way that's confusing. So they're, they're trying to like explicitly tell you what it does. Uh, in the digital world, I think a really good simple example of a, a good mental model is the finder or the way that we stick files in folders. Um, most developers know this, but files aren't stored in one place on your computer. They're all over the disk. So any single file might be in 9,000 different places on your computer's hard drive. And similarly, like folders don't even really exist on the disk. They're not a real thing. It's just made up. And the finder gives us a really good way of understanding uh, files and folders and it lets the user interact with them in a way that mi uh, matches their mental model. They don't have to worry about where the file is on the disk. Uh, they can just stuff it in some folders and move it around and, and treat it like it's a real file. So constraints, and this is the best way to do it, and it's, it's, it's perfectly c explained right there, is preventing errors before they can occur. Uh, designing a, a little bit of forgiveness into it, and maybe even a little bit of, of guidance onto how to interact with something. So I've pulled a couple examples. The predictive text is a great example. I misspell pneumonia all the time. In fact, I quit even trying to spell. I just let Google figure it out for me. So I'll type in something and they go, hey, dummy, did you mean this? And we're actually gonna show you results because we know you meant that because nobody writes pneumonia this way. And Michael gets pneumonia twice a week. At least, at least. Um, there's also a couple other examples here where we have a, um, a Flickr calendar search. Um, because of the way the space-time continuum works, you can't actually search for dates that are in the future yet because nothing has been added to Flickr. So the designers have disabled the ability to search for anything in the future. Um, we also have this example of the uh, contact form. And there's a couple of things that they did nicely here. For instance, uh, the website actually has the HTTP already added for you so we know, hey, you're gonna have to put that in there and in case you don't and we don't wanna return an error, I'll just throw it in there for you. And I also um, like the fact that they broke the phone field into three separate uh, fields. Pre uh, that'd be your area code and your prefix and your, your four numbers. I think this was, I think they probably could have done a better job at this point, but this is a nice, this is a nice beginning of uh, constraint design. Yeah, and constraints are a place that developers can have a lot of impact on the design because a good designer is still probably only going to build in 50% of the constraints that oh, you need. You, you're being way generous. Okay, a good designer is going to build in five 10, to 10% 10 of the constraints that you need. If I'm not busy. <laughs> because they're hard to predict, right? And uh, developers, you know that there's all sorts of different ways that a user can screw up um, the internal model of the system. The data can get out of sync, the data can get all screwed up by different things they do. Especially if you're interacting with a database, there's all sorts of points for error. Uh, your web services can go down, all sorts of stuff. And so, uh, as a developer, you've got a lot of ability to predict those failure points and even discover them during development and then work with your designer to build in more constraints so that the user doesn't, doesn't fail when those things happen, so that the system tries to proactively prevent them. Give them a little bit of forgiveness too. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Very perfect. Okay, so consistency. You have to have visual consistency, otherwise all of a sudden you're driving through the great gated community and then boom, you're in the ghetto and then boom, you're in a gated community again and it's a cognitive dissonance, I can't figure out what I'm trying to do on this page and I'm really not gonna hang out there long if I don't have a clue of what's going on. So visual consistency is a very big deal from the design standpoint. Uh, I think we have a really good example of there too, right? Yeah, yeah. And so consistency is using graphical elements the same way, um, both within your 
using interactive elements the same way within your experience and consistently with other experiences on a computer or in software. And so the, the Twitter app um, for Mac caught a lot of flack because it's so inconsistent with other, other metaphors. They've got the, uh, those three stoplight buttons in the upper right are the max, minimize, maximize, and close buttons. They're usually always red, green, and yellow, um, or, they're, or they're dull gray. And on this application, they're black. They're almost like hard to find. Uh, also, this thing on the far right is more like a toolbar that would normally be at the top, or even a tab bar to select different states in your application, and they've put it over on the far left. Their scroll bar is hard to see and doesn't even necessarily look like a scroll bar. So this just isn't consistent with other ways of uh, building these types of UIs. Another good example of this that we don't have a screenshot for is a new version of iTunes takes that stoplight thing up in the corner and flips it over on its side. It makes it vertical, which no user is going to uh, readily accept. But this, again, is an example of uh, if you know the rules and you know how to use them well, then you can break them. The Twitter application is still really well designed, and it looks like a nice, uh, consistent, holistic user experience, even though it's so inconsistent. So you have to understand these rules in order to break them properly to produce the mood you're trying to produce. They're trying to look uh, chic and innovative and edgy, and so they've, they've done lots of different things. And whether or not it really confuses users too much is sort of up for them to test and up for users to decide. To test. To test. It's a big deal. Yeah, so we'll get to that in, in design research here in a second. So takeaways from our, interac our interaction design segment are um, just to look for ways to make your application more visible, recognizable, reactive, that's that feedback piece, um, safe in constraints, and consistent for users. And so we hope that having those sort of like building blocks for interaction can help you have more productive uh, conversations with designers. Particularly for me, as a developer, the, the concept of affordances has been really useful when talking to designers or assessing UI. Designers are sort of notorious for, well, I guess it's affordances and consistency, um, trying to really push the boundary and make really cool looking stuff. And so they make buttons that don't look like buttons. And they make drop down menus that, that maybe look like calendar widgets, or I don't even know, but they're, they're, they're just really out there. And so being able to um, call attention to that and ask questions. Say, you know, I think that this is, this is a strange affordance. I don't know if the user's gonna understand. Uh, can we talk about why you chose to do it that way? And maybe there's a really good reason, or maybe they were just kind of like going crazy. And so as a developer, you can help to, uh, to rein that in. Great, so let's jump into the design research part because we have about five minutes left. Okay, yep. So we'll try to, well, I think we have enough time to get through this. Cool. Um, so what is design research? So design research to me is a really big deal from the design side of it, right? Um, if we do design research correctly in the beginning, you remove about 30, and I'd even say maybe 40% of the trauma of my life. Because if I know what a user kind of wants to do, where they're gonna be uh, in an environment, what their, their, their reasons for being in that site are, what their goals are, if I have this, all of this data, I've just baked out a lot of assumptions. And sitting in the basement at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to assume that the way I do things, the genius design process, is going to be effective for everybody that's actually a user. So having this research up front actually makes all of the problems that I, I kind of struggle with sort of fade away. I have data to support them. And then I can get right back into the graphic design exercises that we just covered in the beginning of the speech. Yeah. So. So design research encompasses a lot of different activities. And traditionally, we think about it uh, in, in two different phases, mostly up front at the beginning of the design process. Researchers um, who may or may not be the same people doing the graphic and interaction design, those researchers are doing things like uh, customer interviews, contextual inquiry. They're doing primary research into new interaction metaphors. They're going out in the field um, and testing hypotheses and researching people. I don't know if anybody in here was at uh, Kelly Goto's workshop yesterday, but she did a really good workshop on some like basic research methods, and there's a lot of good uh, stuff that her company has been doing into, into design research for a long time. Design research is sometimes accomplished by designers. Other times there's a separate group. Uh, at Effective UI, we have a customer insight and design research group 
that does a lot of this stuff, and it's kind of made from people at different departments. So that's, that's traditionally what design research is, is a lot of uh, upfront stuff that feeds the design process. Well, it's also stuff that happens during the development process and even afterwards. And these things are, are things like um, user heuristic analysis and user testing. User testing can take the form of formal usability testing, where you're sitting in a lab, uh, eye tracking and watching where people click on things and stuff like that. But it can also take the, the form of heuristic or expert analysis. And that's the part I want to dig into today, because I think that this is something that developers can, can play a really large role in. So the first part of any good expert analysis is to analyze your design, because whether or not you know it, you are an expert. As a developer, like I said up front, you're the first user, and you've interacted with more UIs than just about anyone on the planet. And so you can look at a design and, and automatically come up with some good hypotheses on areas that might be difficult for users. You can say, uh, this button doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't know if anyone's going to know how to do this. Uh, why does page A go to page Z over here? Stuff like that. So look through your design as you're building it, before you're building it, and um, try to identify uh, those hunches you have on things that might not be um, intuitive for your users. And then once you have those hunches, um, go validate them. Validate them with some quick user interviews with real people. How many people should you interview? Well, uh, to get statistically significant results, you as a developer would probably think, I need to go interview hundreds of people. What's the point of doing this? It's going to take all sorts of time and money that's better left to, to formal people who do this as a practice. And in a formal environment, you would want to do this. Right. That's but true the, for certain kinds of research. style, you can just go ahead and do a small, a small subset. Yeah, right. So uh, Jacob Nielsen is a usability expert, and he did a big, significantly, uh, st statistically significant study on the number of people you need to identify design problems. And uh, a lot of people take, have, have different feelings on this study, but he found that after about three to eight interviews, you really start to, to see a lot of diminishing returns, and the majority of the usability problems in your application will be found pretty quickly. So this means that if you, as a developer, are just trying to validate a hunch, you really only need to go talk to like three or five people to get a sense of whether you're, you're just way off or whether you've actually found something that's going to be difficult for real people. Uh, who should you interview? In a real usability study, you'd want to work really hard to try to target the same user base that the application is going to use. And if your application is very targeted towards people of a certain culture in a certain region of the world, that might still be appropriate for you. But really, I'd encourage you to just, just go talk to anyone. Um, as a developer, you're so close to the system that you don't know if you can trust your own opinions. So you're just trying to find someone who hasn't been intimately involved in building every, every piece of it. And these people will be just about anywhere. You can walk around on the street and try to interview people with some paper prototypes and say, hey, do you have two minutes? I'm, I'm building this application. I could really use your opinion on something. Uh, you can call friends and family. Your grandma probably wants to hear from you anyway, so you might as well get some billable work done when you That's call right. to check in on her. You could ask her some questions about this stuff. Um, or you can go sit in a cafe and try not to be that creepy guy who's, who's bugging people coming in to buy their coffee. You want to try it? Yeah, so let's try this real quick. Um, okay. Let's pretend for a second like Michael is not a graphic designer, okay. but is a guy just sort of like hanging around on the stage with me. And let's pretend like we built this application. I did not, I, and our company did not. This is an application on the iPad that uh, just showcases innovative pieces of design. And here we have selected to look at the iPod. And it's my hypothesis that these buttons on the far right are not intuitive to users. And so I'm going to validate that by talking to Michael. So I might do that like this. Uh, hey, Michael, I'm building a, an application uh, for the iPad, uh -huh. and uh, I, I have some questions I'd like to ask you yeah, to how see long whether is this it's going to take. It's going to be like a minute now. Okay, cool. Yeah, do, cool. You, do you have a second? Sure, Could you sure. look at something One for minute. Me? Okay, cool. So here's an application that we've built. Okay. Um, it showcases innovative pieces of design. Mm -hmm. What do you think these things on the far right are? Oh, um, I, I, think, I guess they're buttons. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, what makes you think that they're buttons? Well, they're the only things that are on black, and they look like they might be the only things that I can really kind of 
interact with. I don't think okay. I can push the iPod, right? OK. No, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, of the, on these buttons, what do you think that the middle one would do? Oh, if you tap um, it? Uh, volume control. OK. And what do you think the bottom one would do if you tap that? Um, that's like the ellipsis. It'll tell me more. OK. And what about the top button? Yeah, I really don't even know about that one. OK. Is that like a tween? Um, um, no. Well, would you expect it to be a tween? Mm, I don't really, I'm not a designer. I don't even know what tween means. Yeah, I don't. I don't. <laughs> OK. OK. Cool, thanks a lot. I mean, if you're interested, just so you know, the, the middle button actually pops out some text to tell you about what the application does. Oh, bad consistency, right? Because we had two columns over there for text. That is not a two-column layout. That's bad. a designer word. How did you know that? OK, so some of the things that you saw there in the demo is I didn't call those out as buttons right away. No I leading said, questions. What do you think that those are? And so yeah, it's very important when you're doing these quick interviews not to let your hunches or your view of the system come through to a user. And then I tried to ask Michael, um, what do you think about this? What would you expect this to do? He sort of threw me a, for a loop when uh, he said that tween thing about the top one. Uh, that wasn't at all something we practiced, Michael. Um, but uh, the, the thing I was trying to recover with is saying, uh, what would you expect it to do? What would you expect a tween to do? Do you think a tween would be valuable? Just dig into his feedback a little more and find out what about his perception of the system led him to give that, that answer. And I think a good heuristic for uh, the practitioner is to pretend you're three and just keep asking why. Why is the sky blue? Well, because it's not green. Why? Well, because you wouldn't know where to stop mowing your lawn. Why? Why? Just nonstop. Pull it out of them. Yeah, up to that, up to that two minutes. You want to be respectful of people's time. Mm -hmm. um, so then the last part of any good research activity is analyzing your results. If this was some kind of big formal study, we'd want to produce a report where we described the types of questions we asked and who we interviewed and got our feedback. But really for this, you just want to take a few notes down. Remember things like, oh, Michael said the middle, vol the middle button was a volume control. Remember that. And then you go back to your designer, um, if they've come back from lunch or if they're hard to get a hold of. And now you can say, hey, man, I, I had a question about the buttons on this. I don't know that the icons make a lot of sense to users. And I went and talked to like four people, and they all think that the middle button is a volume control. Um, do you think maybe we should do something about that? Yeah, and if your designer is worth his salt, he's going to say, <laughs> or thank hers. you so much. Or his or her salt, they're going to say, thank you so much. I kind of half-assed that one. Let's, uh, let's revisit that. Yeah. So um, that is a quick way to do design research and how developers can be involved in design research. Again, design research is a gigantic discipline with all sorts of other stuff that we weren't able to talk about today. But hopefully, you know a little bit more now about how you can be a helpful design researcher. Mm -hmm. Get out there and talk to users in ways that you can, uh, you can validate those hunches. So in conclusion, to wrap up, um, don't disrespect your designers. Everything that we've covered today is a huge 1,000-foot overview to give you some language. Um, but they still know way more about this. Uh, it's not like we've pulled back the curtain and it's just some guy sitting back there. This is a real discipline as detailed and involved as development. And it makes us feel really special when you want to hear more. So and I do. Ask. More. Um, do appreciate beautiful design, graphic, interactive, or otherwise and validate your hunches with quick user interviews. And now Michael has some, some concluding pro tips on good design. Pro tips for good design. This is really easy. If you, brought, if you bring this into your designers, they're going to love you for it. First off, please do not use Comic Sans. Don't use this font. We're running a company here, not a lemonade stand. No Comic Sans. Don't use yellow on white. Come on, ow, my cones and rods. Don't use all caps with scripts. Bad form. Don't put drop shadows on everything. Please don't. And it's so easy now. Drop shadows, yeah, drop shadows, drop shadows. But they're shadow. so pretty. Please don't make the logo bigger. Please don't. But do feel empowered to do design. Because you're doing it anyway, and you have the skill set, and you have the knowledge. And if this is a really, truly collaborative environment, then I need you to come to me with problems, and I need you to help me solve those problems. Thank you.